Welcome, everyone. After the networking break, we are proceeding with our agenda and uh, coming to the next session, which is AI powered commercial teams. Uh, definitely very interesting one. We have some pretty senior speakers in that session. So from left to the right, please to welcome uh, Nikos, the senior vice president and global commercial execution head from Novartis. Hi, Nikos. How are you? Very well. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We have Chetak, the global head of commercial excellence of Merck from Germany and in Germany. Hi, Chetak. How are you? Thanks, Daddy. And from UK, we have Chris Wade, the Associate Vice President of Omnipresence. <coughs> or, of course, not any more Omnipresence, but uh, you made a very interesting rebranding. But Chris, you can maybe give a few words about that as well. Sure. Thanks so much, Dario, and thanks everyone for being able to join. And yes, um, you know, as of a couple of days, Omnipresence has rebranded itself to being Exivo. So uh, you know, do take the chance to drop by our booth at some point over the next couple of days. Great. So let's kick off and uh, let's start first with you, Chetak, which is there was disruption, especially in the start. And we talk about augmentation of the rep. When reps were under lockdown, augment, augmented and uh, couldn't, couldn't do too much, right? Yeah. So Chetak, how do you leverage early understanding through reps to digital engagement? Mm -hmm. And uh, how this new normal is, is looking like in that regard? Thanks, Dario, and uh, yeah, a great pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, augmenting rep uh, as a concept uh, has been around uh, since the day rep uh, came into existence. Uh, uh, even 20 years ago, when I started, started my career as a rep, uh, there were always efforts to augment rep because that's so critical link in the organization interfacing with our customers. Uh, so the good thing going into pandemic uh, for us was that there were already efforts underway that how we can leverage as we evolved uh, more and more technology to augment uh, the work of rep and not only rep uh, but the whole continuum and i can speak at least for the commercial function uh, uh, across sales marketing and tons of back-end operations that eventually feed into that uh, what we call as customer engagement. Uh, and if I have to kind of paint that picture, uh, broadly speaking, uh, uh, looking at the augmentation of rep and how we can leverage uh, AI uh, to drive that, but increasingly important is how you augment uh, marketing of the future and how you drive that uh, personalization of the content as an experience. Uh, and underneath uh, is, uh, there are, as I say, tons of processes uh, uh, ranging from how you upskill the organization and how AI could be contributing towards uh, upskilling of the organization from a training perspective, how you use technology to be smarter when it comes to re resource allocation and territory management, territory designing, things like that. And then uh, uh, again, coming back to rep and augmenting rep, uh, I think the biggest use case that we see uh, already quite mature is uh, how you understand the customer better based on not only customer data, but also the territory and environment data, which effectively then provides you superior insights, uh, driving a better targeting of the customer. So that's the kind of a canvas uh, that we see here. Thank you, Chadak. Nikos, same question for you. Yeah, I think I, I, I agree with uh, Chadak. It's, it's about equipping our people with the best technologies and the best tools uh, to do their job. And we can talk about what that job is and what that role was and will be in the future. But the way I see it as well is about uh, getting those tools uh, seamlessly integrated in the workflow of uh, our people and allowing them to uh, maximize what they're doing at best. Uh, and this is, as uh, Chadak said as well, it's not something new. It's a journey that has always been going on. Um, when I was a rep, I had my cell phone uh, that I would check voicemail uh, with. And before that, uh, people had to go to a payphone. And then later on, we had computers and CRM uh, systems. And uh, subsequently to that, we have added many, many capabilities and today, uh, at least at Novartis for the last few years, we have been working uh, quite a lot on developing uh, digital AI assistance 
that uh, seamlessly integrate with uh, what the rep day looks like to maximize both the efficiency and effectiveness and ultimately make their jobs more easy and more effective. Um, and it's a journey that I'm sure is going to continue. The big question, however, as I said before, is what is the current and the future role that we envision uh, our field forces to have to play in uh, the healthcare pharmaceutical environment and the ability to drive sales in conjunction with other marketing uh, strategies and other digital only uh, channels. Thank you. Chris, uh, what is the infrastructure needed to successfully implement AI powered solutions? Uh, you're muted, Chris. So that, thanks, Dario. So, uh, I, I mean, I think you know, as as as, as Chetak and uh, and Nikos have said, it's like it's pretty understandable that organisations, um, you know, when they started to to look at AI and how to apply it, they started where you know their biggest investments were and where their highest impact points were. So, you know, and that's of course why you know so much of the early work around uh, you know developing you know an infrastructure for AI was very focused on on the field organisations. So. You know the next best action um, initiatives. You know they were you know all about you know making the rep more effective. Um, you know delivering some intelligence to them which they you know wouldn't have been aware of. You know what do I do next? What do I do differently? Um, but when we go beyond that, when we start to look at you know AI as something which can support the whole commercial organisation, so not just our field organisation, but you know all of those different functions. Um, you know across the marketing. Um, community to medical, medical affairs, market access, and others. You know, we need to look at some sort of more more fundamental uh, components. And of course, one of them is is having our data available. Um, that's the idea of unification. Whether it's having you know a data lake in place, whether it is thinking about our, our systems more as a platform, so we have all of our customer information and activities and all of our business processes sitting over one platform um, or available from one platform so that's a you know quite a big decision that that organizations have to take if they've you know gone down um a more siloed approach you know i've got a crm system for my for my field force i've got a different system for my medical affairs team i've got a different system again for marketing well in order to to you know to, to actually make ai work it has to be able to take data from all of those places to make sense of it um, and you know, alongside that, we have to look at these opportunities. Um, you know, what we call institutionalization. You know, how do we find opportunities to embed AI into you know the normal working life of all of these people? Um, you know, all of our colleagues um, and professionals who make up these teams. So this might be focused at you know things which are really addressing productivity. How can I you know get rid of you know mundane. Uh, repetitious tasks you know note taking uh you know uh, you know planning activities which i do over and over again um and are just highly manual can those be automated can i use a chatbot you know to, to 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 help me with some of those processes or something similar and of course scalability is everything because you know if it takes us three months to deliver you know a single algorithm um that you know is used for one brand in one particular setting taking that to you know to a global scale um, is going to be extremely difficult so we have to have an infrastructure that aids scalability so you know that's you know often where we see one of some of the key benefits of taking a more um, platform ecosystem approach where you know you're making a, a core technology decision as to which is the platform that we're going to work with and then that enables you to build your own ecosystem around that of these kinds of solutions. So we can you know, plug in the necessary, you know, the AI componentry that we need to support one team versus another. Um, but it's, you know, it's it, it's a big challenge and a big topic. And clearly we've seen uh, you, know, you know, lots of the larger companies making you know huge investments in, in their infrastructure around their data um, because they recognize that without having the data um, available. You know, you're only ever taking is very, very sort of, you know, siloed or you know, narrow slices through the organization. I'm just seeing, for example, what my reps are doing. 
and that gives me no indication of what's happening across all of those other touch points um, which which customers engage with um, say in in the digital setting or in other parts of the business and if you if you if you go down that path that's when you get in trouble with AI because you know you're taking a very distorted view of of the data that's available it's not a complete view of the market you know it's it's a it, you know it's a it's a very siloed um, or biased view and that's one of the key things we need to, you know good infrastructure will help you address so it's like five thousand pieces of puzzle coming together right <laughs> exactly exactly and 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 often it's you know the real challenge of AI um, and its real strength is its ability to look beyond what we would be able to do as humans mm. so i'm not it's not a case of of looking at you know a rep or a team's performance and saying the trend looks the trend looks good the trend looks bad it's about taking you know meaning from all of the data points that relate to that that you know that that individual territory so not just what the reps doing but what the customers are doing what patients are doing what's happening in the market what's happening you know guidelines and, and, and governance decisions and just and, and that is the real power of an effective AI infrastructure is it, it, it enables that it also clearly creates some big challenges around you know data scaling and you know where is that data going to come from because it's not something a lot of it's not going to be purchased data you know it's it's accessing a lot of public public you know access data to sort of build out these pictures and provide a more robust you know foundation for 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 mm. designing uh you know designing the these ai processes thank you chris chetak coming back to you same question first of all and i know that you're very and extremely passionate about ai in commercial teams so how do and what do you see as the necessary infrastructure which we need for a successful ai implementation chetak you're mute Chetak, you are muted. I think Chetak's disappeared. <laughs> yes, he is now just coming back. Maybe Nikos, you can provide an answer on that in the meantime. Yeah, sure, definitely. Um, yeah, I think what Chris brought up uh, in terms of the infrastructure, it's just such an underlying foundation that uh, we underestimate so often, especially large uh, companies that uh, uh, operate on a lot of legacy systems, but also when you look on the commercial uh, uh, world in particular, it tends to be very fragmented, very country or brand specific, localized with specific data sources and specific systems and agents, a agencies that they have been operating on. Um, the commercial organizations usually um, work on a much more uh, short term um, time cycles, uh, quarterly results, yearly results, and there has not been a need for a systematic, necessarily uh, long-term longitudinal uh, data strategy. Um, in other parts of comp the company, uh, HR systems, finance systems, they do s tend to have more um, uh, structure behind them just by nature of regulation and the, re and the rules that we have to follow. But when it comes to the commercial world, I have found uh, certainly uh, that the fragmentation is a big body. Now that's one of what I view as four key pillars in being able to achieve what we're talking here about AI and digital and all that. Uh, the infrastructure is absolutely uh, one of those foundational four pillars. The other three, um, two of them I, I, I view as more easy to handle and that has to do with resources you put behind these kinds of efforts and large companies usually they can afford uh, to spend, as Chris said, uh, a lot of money behind uh, these efforts. Uh, so I don't view that as a big barrier when there is uh, certainly the, the need to do that. And the second, uh, 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 the second pillar is around technology itself, the technical skills. And again, that even though it's scarce and it's expensive, it's commoditized. People know how to do these kinds of things, uh, what it takes to do an AI algorithm, what it takes to to put uh, systems uh, in place and all that. So the technical skills and the resource skills are not the big issue. The big issue is what Chris said about the infrastructure. And the fourth pillar is the change management that comes with it in an organization to be able to embrace 
the new way of operating, whether it is uh, about inst institutionalizing uh, uh, more uh, universal platforms uh, from a technical perspective, or how we operate in the front lines where we talked before about the augmentation of our field forces and our people's uh, uh, capabilities with technology, there's not always that willingness and adoption of that technology to the extent that uh, we hope for. So those four pillars uh, in my mind are critical and two of them, the infrastructure and change management are certainly the most uh, difficult to handle in uh, today's world uh, amongst uh, our company at least. Definitely. It's always about the culture, for sure. Etak, can you hear us? Yeah, I can. And can you? Yes, perfect. Excellent. Sorry for the technical glitch. Uh, something went wrong with the device, it seems. But uh, yeah, I, 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 and I, I could listen most of uh, uh, what you guys were talking about. Uh, and, and for me, I mean, uh, the starting point is also a little bit of a paradox that we as a healthcare uh, industry face, right? Uh, uh, I mean, if when we compare healthcare, especially from data and data uh, access perspective, uh, you have this paradox where you have much more data than uh, you compare with many other industries. Uh, but the challenge with that data is that oftentimes uh, it is uh, siloed, uh, it is unstructured, uh, unclean data uh, sitting in different parts of the organization. And that, uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, is the biggest challenge uh, to uplift the organization uh, from a data uh, architecture standpoint, making sure that uh, you have, uh, first of all, first of all, you know what data you have in the organization. That itself is a huge exercise in a large organization to go through. And then how you make sure that it is structured uh, in such a way that you it allows you to uh, kind of uh, develop uh, algorithms, etc. So the starting point uh, is the data architecture and access to data, and then comes uh, the resource. Uh, you, uh, it's it's a new uh, area, data science itself, uh, and how you make sure that uh, you have right uh, access uh, to the resource pool. But for me, this is uh, the hardware, and this is uh, something that gets addressed eventually. Uh, the real challenge starts from there, uh, which is uh, the point that Nikos was alluding to around culture, change management, and our ability to scale it uh, at an enterprise level. Uh, and and that, that's where uh, we often see uh, the difference uh, uh, that will get realized different between different organizations. And also the point being, uh, when it comes to change management, also to realize that uh, this AI uh, and the way to leverage AI to improve operations is not like implementing an IT tool uh, and often uh, uh, kind of managing expectation. That's the uh, uh, challenge that we face uh, is to say that uh, it's one thing to go with an algorithm and you, for example, looking at it uh, from a customer preference perspective, uh, as we know, at the end, customers are human beings uh, and their preferences keep on evolving. So how do you make sure that your uh, algorithms and the understanding of those data points are constantly evolving? Uh, and that means uh, uh, going live with an AI solution is not uh, the end point, but it's a starting point on a journey which needs to be constantly uh, uh, evolving. And that means, uh, the, the way you allocate resources behind it uh, and the way you manage also the funding and scaling of those opportunities. Thank you, Chetak. We spoke about the smart culture, but let's speak about a smart future. And let's start with you, Nikos, and with the question, how will AI challenge traditional barriers in life science and pharma? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, that's certainly a good question. I think. In the last year, for sure, um, I think a lot of people are saying that this has been a, an experiment um, and we've learned quite a lot, but um, it has also been um, a, an equalizing um, year, a, a year where everyone was on the same boat. I think the real uh, insights will come as we start transitioning more to uh, a normal uh, world where uh, companies and uh, um, 
brands and field forces will have the choice of how to operate. And I think what we will see is some um, will embrace um, these uh, digital tools and augmentation uh, dif to different extents. I think we will start seeing um, uh, more, more control experiments of what works and what doesn't. And uh, I think the jury is still out there in terms of how much uh, uh, only digital versus uh, a more balanced uh, way and the augmented uh, wrap uh, we will see. I think there's a lot of uh, um, a, a lot of opinions right now that suggest that uh, we will actually uh, uh, go back to, uh, to to the wraps and 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 the, the way of interacting with the physicians. And there are reasons I can go into why that might be the, uh, a big part of what the future um, of what uh, the future could look like might be. Um, but certainly, I think we have learned uh, tremendous amounts uh, and we have accelerated uh, tenfold uh, a lot of these efforts in the last year, all of us. Uh, but uh, what I'm looking forward to is what is going to happen in the next uh, one to three years, which will set us up basically for uh, the longer term uh, future. Thank you very much. Chris, same question for you. Um, I, I'll give it, I'll, I'll give it the, uh, <laughs> probably the, the, the Exivo answer. So I think, you know, you have to look at, you know, look at the last year, you know, the organizations which have been able to, you know, best cope with everything that the pandemic threw at them is the ones that they're, they're designed, they're designed for innovation, but they're also designed for disruption. So they had, you know, systems in place that were flexible enough to be able to change how they operated not fundamentally because there hasn't been fundamental change um we've added some new capabilities we're doing things in slightly different ways but you know no one's turned their organization upside down um but what we have done is seen you know those companies which can you know better take the information that they have and and you know their sets of of uh, you know engagement channels different parts of the organization and switch that balance um, so, you know, yeah, there's been that period where, you know, what are the reps going to do? They're all kind of sitting at home on their hands going, you know, I can't see anybody. So, you know, the marketing departments had to really focus on their, 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 their digital touch points in the short term, whilst they, you know, very quickly got, you know, got things in order in order to be able to do, you know, take those little, those little pilot projects they've been running on the remote side and taken them into a new you know you know you know into a, a mainstream activity but i think if we're looking at the you know the future uh the future role of, of ai in the commercial function then i think you know, i don't think there's any doubt that you know the cut that a big part of this is about making those those core infrastructure decisions around you know which platforms are we going to build on we can't operate in a world where we have 30 different platforms to support one business. You look at, you know, in other industry sectors, you know, you look at, you know, the back office. It, you know, it, we went it, we went ERP two de you know, two, three decades ago um, because it made sense. The same thing has to happen in the commercial space. So whether we're talking about customers as HCPs, customers as patients, they have to be supported on, on you know, the same core data platforms so that we can operate uh, flexibly, we can learn um, and improve what we're doing, you know, make better offer to customers, be more responsive, you know, so everything, anytime any, we ever mentioned customer experience, there's an assumption that that is AI behind it. It's the only way that it can work. There's too many moving parts. If for it to be based on somebody manually thinking, oh, I will just add that channel to the mix. It's not about, you know, creating a, you know, a, a, a customer journey of, of 5,000 post-it notes. It's about making those decisions automatically about somebody has engaged, has, 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 you know, looked at one of our pieces of content. How does that change what we do next? And that's not whether it's a target customer or a non-target customer. It shouldn't make any difference. We might respond differently because you're a target customer. We might respond differently because you're a patient. Um, but that's, you know, some of these, these are the more fundamental shifts that have to take place around how we think about the, the the purpose of data, you know what we're trying to do with it, how we could and how it can you know help us operate better, 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I think there's an enormous scope for uh, for AI to change and improve how com the commercial function works. Um, but it starts with these building blocks. Definitely. Thank you, Chris. Chetak, anything you want to add? Now, just to uh, build on what uh, Chris and Nikos were saying, uh, and uh, to put it differently, I think the point uh, we have certainly crossed the point of uh, questioning. Like uh, we are no more uh, there to say why or what is AI. I think uh, a lot of uh, uh, those opportunities have been fairly mapped out uh, in the industry. The real uh, kind of question now is how do you go about realizing the opportunity? And there, uh, there's no one size fits all approach. Uh, there is an element uh, coming from a technology perspective, what Chris was alluding to, what uh, uh, say uh, the technology partners could bring to the table. But the even bigger question then uh, from an organization perspective is, uh, how you drive this, uh, how you kind of uh, institutionalize it. Uh, and, and that's that's where uh, I think uh, you will have different approaches uh, and that is perfectly fine. That's how uh, we go about doing things uh, and that's what makes uh, each organization unique. Uh, uh, but that's, that's where uh, I think most of the debate uh, uh, is right now and uh, it will be fascinating uh, Certainly, if I have to paint the future, uh, not even going too far, uh, in next uh, uh, kind of 18 to 24 months, we should even start seeing uh, different companies talking about uh, realizing value, not only limited to next best action, which has been very well articulated, uh, uh, but that's already a baseline uh, to start with. Uh, uh, but uh, other opportunities that we talked uh, in the beginning would be fascinating to see unfolding in coming months. Thank you, Chetak. We are left with two minutes, and I would like to pick some questions. Uh, one in particular, which I find very interesting, and this is, does AI create a challenge for transparency in customer-facing tools? Just a short answer. Chris? Uh, it, it, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> it's the simplest answer. That's the um, answer. I mean, it, it, you know, clearly, you know, any, you know, there is a design decision in building an algorithm. So, you know, that is a, a real challenge in some settings at the moment that algorithm design has a lot of inherent flaws. Um, and there's a huge amount of work going into trying, you know, try and address that, remove bias, trans, you know, embed transparency into, into the actual fundamentals of, of AI. Because there is an element of, particularly in deep AI, you can't see it, it's a black box. You do not know what the, what the AI is deciding. You only know what data it's basing its decisions on. Um, so yeah, that is absolutely a challenge in a, a regulated sector to be able to provide a level of comfort um, or you know of, of risk mitigation that you know you haven't designed a, pro a runaway process but sort of you know uh, creating bias where there is none. Thank you, Nikos. Chetak, short answer. Yeah, uh, I think the uh, the fact that we're in a regulated industry is certainly something we need to be very aware of. Um, but we are not the only regulatory industry. There's so many industries that have high regulation. So I think we can definitely learn of some of those uh, uh, topics and uh, risk mitigation, digital risk mitigation should be uh, uh, high on all of our radar screens. Uh, we do at Novartis certainly deploy a lot of uh, AI uh, uh, risk mitigation uh, techniques, uh, both on the data itself uh, but also for detection and other uh, ways of uh, processing signals as they come in for adverse events and uh, non-compliance and so on. And I think uh, those are the kinds of tools and there are a lot of uh, partners we have in that space that can definitely help us uh, to do so and uh, secure both uh, what we do to be um, within the rules that we need to adhere, but also to uh, uh, secure um, our customers and our patients and uh, our own uh, uh, data uh, that uh, all the stakeholders are expecting. Thank you. Chaitak, any final words? No, it has been already uh, very well uh, articulated by Chris and Nico. Okay, gentlemen, in that case, thank you very much. Coming next, reinventing relevance, uh, reimagining pharma's role, creating quality ATP experiences. That sounds interesting, right? So stay tuned. Uh, stay here and uh, 
Thank you again for joining this interesting session. Have a nice rest of the day. Thank Bye -bye. you.